All right. Thank you, everyone. I know that we are a little bit behind what you see in the schedule. I'm going to do my best to do a little bit of housekeeping along with my colleague Aaron Lynch from QEM and get you off and going into the work of reflecting, connecting, and raising smart questions about how we'll sustain this good work. So what we'd like to start with is a land acknowledgement. There we go. Now I'll turn it over to Aaron. Thank you, good morning. Perfect. Uh, we respectfully would like to begin by making sure that we acknowledge that our convening is located on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, who actually lived here in uh, Capitol Hill, uh, part of the Algonquin Nation. And our neighbors of the ancestral lands of the Pakataway, the Punkamone, and Punkamone people. We recognize that the nations of the mm, Pamunkey, thank you, Indian tribe, the Chicomani, the Eastern Chicomani, and the Upper Mattapone, the Rappahannock, the Nansaman, the Monacans, the Nanapi, and the Natakoke, Padawans, uh, Susquehanna, Tutulo, and Saponi tribes all continue to live within this very area and the surrounding areas of Virginia and Maryland. As academics, it is our responsibility to make sure that we acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations and that the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations from their people um, are part of the historical dispossession that has allowed for the growth of our academic institutions and organizations. Consistent with the includes hub uh, commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, we acknowledge that the historical and current experiences of native peoples um, as it helps to inform the work that we do and our colleagues in the um, network who are doing that work. For additional information about supporting Native American scholarship and advocacy, we highly recommend that you check out the American Indian College Fund, uh, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, and the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans, as well as some great projects that NSF has already supported um, in this work. There's an REU project called Increasing Native American Perspectives in the field and exper experimental linguistics by researchers at the University of Oregon, Eugene, Drs. Abrela Perez Baez and Spike Gileda. The Native Science Report, uh, which supports broadening participation of Haitian awareness and amplifying Native voices by researcher Dr. Paul Boyer at Sistatan Wap Wapatan Community College. Drone Research and Opportunities for Native Elementary Students uh, by researcher Don Dayano DeFeo at the University of Alaska Anchorage as well as grounding science education, indigenous knowledge, food systems, and sustainability by researchers Megan Jarko, Elise Boxer, Jennifer Fierro at the University of South Dakota. And if you actually have time to get out of sessions, right up the street at the Renwick Museum, which is completely free, um, they're hosting a um, exhibition called Sharing Honors and Burdens. The Renwick Invitational 2023 focused on fresh and nuanced visions by six Native American and Alaskan Native artists who express the honors and burdens that connect the people to one another, and that is free if you get out of sessions right up the street. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, please. Yeah, we don't have one today. <laughs> so we'd like to share just a few logistics and updates with you. Um, first, we want to start off. Many of you have already accessed the Cvent app. Some of you have not. We'd like to invite you to, if you haven't already, to download the Cvent app. And for those who have downloaded it but have not yet populated it with sessions over the next couple of days, please do so. Next slide. Here are some instructions about how to do that. Once you download the app, there's a very long event ID. You can also find it at the registration <laughs> desk because it'll be difficult to actually track that. There is also, I believe, a QR code available at the registration desk to facilitate. Oh. <laughs> I just, it just clicked. It's the name of the conference. NSF, Eddie, Bernice, Johnson, and Clute. It just clicked. It just clicked. 
like, what are all those letters? There's always a rhyme to the reason. Okay. All right. Reason to the rhyme. Okay. So go ahead, enter your first name, last name, email, and log in. Update your profile. Browse the different modules. Next slide. Specifically, to create your schedule, follow those instructions. I'm not going to read them to you. Um, but it's pretty simple. There are two options. You can click on the icon, the schedule icon, and get there. And there is easy access to adding sessions. Um, or you can scroll through the, the options up top. Next slide, please. So we want to take a, a moment. I'm going to let Erin do this because Erin's been engaged with um, her colleagues in the coordination hub for a while now, and so I'm gonna let you do this. <laughs> also, so we just wanna make sure you know who's in the room. Um, as members of the Alliance, or I'm sorry, as members of the network, which we all are, our network is comprised of alliances, individually funded projects, individuals who are just really passionate about doing this work, people who wanna be funded by the NSF, make sure you know these people. And so we wanna make sure that you are introduced to your leadership team who helps to support all the great work that you all are doing. So we're gonna do, like we do black church size, like, hey, right here, okay. Um, so our colleagues from Education Development uh, Center, our EDC folk, they're all back here and here, wonderful. We all have our yellow will help you badges. Okay. Our colleagues from Equal Measure. Our colleagues also. Okay, we're going to have a discussion about how everyone's clustered in this side of the room to diversify. Okay. Our colleagues from RS Impact. In the back of the room. Okay. Great. Our colleagues from Quality Education Minority Network. Where's my executive director? She's here somewhere. Okay. Um, where's she? No, she was, okay. Uh, our colleagues from SRI International, they are all over, yep. Okay. And then our colleagues from Wested, who will be doing the next session. Wonderful. And our next slide, we need to roll through, thanks. Uh, other housekeeping things, the location for the restrooms, their signs out in the lobby. The Wi-Fi password is includes 2023, make sure you use the conference one. And we do have an awesome wellness room if you are just getting here today but didn't have the opportunity to see it yesterday, go see the wellness room. They've got arts and crafts and coloring and Sudoku. Like it is, it was really, really well done. Please respect the protocols of that wellness room. We do not take phone calls in the wellness room. So if you gotta take a call, go outside, right? The wellness room is our safe space. No phone calls. Okay, thanks. Next slide. Conversational practices. Right. So as we engage over the next couple of days, we'd like to invite you to keep in mind these conversational practices. I'm not going to read the entire list, but I will highlight a few of them. So listen to learn. Take responsibility for your own learning as well as for not in pushing others about what they should be learning. Um, share re responsibility uh, to include all voices. So make space and take some space. Be present and engaged. The use of cell phones, we know we all have to get things done. There's a lot of work waiting for us back at home. But be mindful about how you engage with your technology in sessions. And lastly, disagree without discord. Um, challenge ideas and not the people. All right, I'm squinting because when I'm tired, my eyes fade fast. Um, next slide. We'd love to invite you to also connect with us um, on the social media platforms. We're on Twitter. Uh, that is our hashtag. And also through the website, includes network dot org. Next slide. COVID safety. So we have been very fortunate to be clear and guided by a COVID safety protocol you can, and policy. You can find that in the CVINT app in the program guide. We also have been quite intentional about making sure that we do our level best to one, be transparent and keep you updated about changes 
And one of those changes is if there is someone among us who unfortunately comes down with COVID, we invite you to let us know. The person you're gonna let know is Leilani Lopez, and we'll let the community know so that people can make choices and just be informed. We're also taking some intentional actions to make sure that we are being as safe as possible by providing masks at all of the tables. There should also be masks in each of the break rooms, just in case, and you can find them at the registration desk. There is also hand sanitizer spread throughout on multiple surfaces. Um, and in breakout rooms and here in the main ballroom, you'll notice that we're often using mic covers. It's really difficult um, to quickly switch out mic covers, but please give us a bit of grace as we try to be safe. Um, and again, wear your mask and be mindful that some people don't have an option. Uh, they have to wear the mask and be safe for many different reasons. Lastly, um, we are excited to um, know that the former Congresswoman will be joining us later today, um, and we are preparing for that. One of the steps in our preparation is that we are creating a guest book. And in the guest book, we've invited, we've provided some empty pages for people uh, to write a special message to the former Congresswoman about the impact of this work. Um, stories about how you have leveraged the opportunity, things you're excited about. Um, and so there are pages up front. We invite you to go grab a page and a Sharpie and then return it to the registration desk. If you could do that um, as soon as possible, we'd love to compile um, a number, as, as many as possible, so that we can present, bind it and present it to the Congresswoman, former Congresswoman. Okay, have I forgotten anything? <laughs> there are a lot of people making sure I know what to say. Okay, so we are moving into our strand one plenary session. Is there a person, Tori? Okay. Tori's gonna come up and help us transition? Yes, perfect. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Lost it. There we are. Thank you very much to James and to Sylvia, um, also to Dr. Ponch for the welcome session. And now it's time, I wore sleeves that were already rolled up, but it's time to roll up your sleeves and we're going to get to work. Uh, thank you to the Hub team for mentioning the gift that we're planning for the Congresswoman. I will only just add that we need your contributions by 3 p.m. in order for this to be properly put together and presented to her um, this evening in the 5 p.m. session. We need to make sure that if you do want to contribute and your contributions are entirely voluntary, if you would like to contribute, we'll just need that by 3 p.m. So thank you very much for those of you who choose to take advantage of that opportunity. All right, measurement is a key focus for NSF's Eddie Bernice Johnson Includes Initiative. If that message hasn't come across already, you will see how important it is as we go throughout these next two days. Through Includes, NSF's desire really is to build a movement. And that movement is starting with this national network which is comprised of funded projects and allied partners who are working together in an ecosystem to identify challenges and change systems in order to broaden participation in STEM. And of course, there are many facets to the work. There are many challenges to address, and the INCLUDES initiative is comprehensive in the way that projects focus on different educational levels, different disciplinary areas, different populations, and different contexts. And so measuring progress and success in that kind of a comprehensive initiative 
can be a challenge. We talked about that some yesterday with the alliances, but this community is, is navigating the waters of measurement and evaluation, and we are already seeing signs of progress. So this week, we are going to share more about that progress um, in a document that we'll share, share more about later. But it's our goal to allow you to see that early progress and then today, in, in this session especially, to focus on continuing that work. So it's important that we understand the framework that the initiative is using to scaffold our collaborative efforts toward equity-driven systems change. And it's really important to conceptualize what it's going to look like for each of you to operationalize systems change in your work. Different contexts, different systems, and this is where we're going to start, well, not start, continue the thought and the collaboration toward putting that together. I am confident that this is going to be a great session. I think I've hyped it up to every single individual that I've talked with already this week. But before the panel begins, I do want to acknowledge the three distinct efforts that really make up measurement for this initiative. And so I think if we advance in slides, oh, I, oh, wonderful, I can do it myself. I don't wanna click the wrong button. I'm assuming I'm clicking the fireworks. There's two green buttons. It's the, big one, the, arrow. <laughs> the, the arrow or the fireworks? Okay, there we go, I just didn't want to mess anything up. Um, actually, let's see, there we are. Okay, so first is the work of the hub. And I want to make these distinctions really clear as we move forward. So among the hub's functions is shared measures. Uh, the hub team co-creates and gathers shared measures with and for the national network in order to support peer learning. So the panel for this session is going to feature three experts who will help to clarify the ways that the various measurement structures in the INCLUDES network help us understand these cross-cutting themes and specifics and how collaborative infrastructure can lay a foundation for equity-driven systems change. You likely have received, if you're newer to the network, you will receive requests for information from the hub to support the shared measures work each of your includes awards letters, if you read sort of the fine print, you'll see that there is a statement about collaborating as a condition of the award with the hub because this really is important work. Then there's the work of ORS Impact, who was introduced a bit earlier. They're the evaluators for the coordination hub. And so you may have received or those newer to the network will receive requests for information from ORS Impact as well. You may have seen an invitation to participate in the National Network Survey, for example. ORS Impact administers that survey and it allows them to assess if and how the network is growing and developing. And there may be other requests for information that come as ORS Impact continues its work in evaluating the hub. Third is the program level evaluation for the INCLUDES initiative as a whole. And so again, three distinct efforts. I know sometimes people think the hub is the evaluator for the program and that's not the case. Each of these are sort of three distinct efforts, three distinct lines. And so that you all wouldn't think that we were just telling you that and, and not actually doing that, I want to introduce to you all the team that is conducting the program level evaluation for the INCLUDES initiative. It is a partnership of three organizations, In Touch Strategies, BCT Partners, and Community Science. Not everyone from the team could be here this week, but there is a contingent somewhere in the room. So let's just, I'll call names. Actually, and if you all will just come to the front so that the network can see this other very critical part of the network. I believe Carlos Anguiano is here. There's Carlos, he's coming. And Ibrahim Braima, did Ibrahim make it? And we have Janae Harrington, Justin Hudson, Deborah Spigner, and Peter York. Is anyone else from the team here? That's everyone? Okay, I wanted to make sure I wasn't leaving anyone out. So this is the team that is conducting the evaluation for INCLUDES. And I'm looking at these slides and thinking that 
I don't think we have, nope. So this is, I don't know how to go back. Oh, maybe this one. This is not the most updated version. We will make sure there is a version of the slides that shows you the seven specific questions that this team is looking at for the initiative. And we want you to see those so that you can imagine how the questions you're asking about your individual projects connect to this larger work. So we'll see what we can do to, to switch to the updated slide deck here. But I did want you to see this team. They are considering those questions. They've already generated some early evidence from your annual report. And they too will be reaching out to you with information requests. So we do want you to make, sh we want to make sure you understand that these requests are coordinated. You've heard me say intentionally that three different groups may be reaching out for information. We do coordinate the efforts where possible to minimize the burden on you. We want you to have time to do the work and not just constantly answer requests for information and reporting on the work. But thank you. You all can uh, return to your seats. I just wanted you all to see and be introduced to, to that team. All right, so let's see, where do we go from here? Let me go back now that I know how to do that um, to the theory of change slide. Another way that these efforts are coordinated is because they're all using the same overarching framework. And that is the theory of change that you see here, as well as on posters on the walls in the back I can see. And you're al you also can access it online. It's part of our newer solicitation, NSF 22-622. It could be a whole session just exploring this theory of change in detail. We won't do that because I have promised to try to help us make up a little bit of time. But I did want to let you know that you have an opportunity. There are sticky notes at the table. You can actually interact with the theory of change that's posted on the back walls and really start to envision, conceptualize how your work, where your work connects in the theory of change. What you'll see in the triangles are sort of the three primary approaches for includes, so it's building collaborative infrastructure, then there's fostering network formation and growth, then there's leveraging the allied efforts, and each one of those approaches is associated with an outcome. So building collaborative infrastructure is expected to yield more effective collaborations. Fostering network formation, engagement, capacity building, and growth is expected to yield more network connectivity and leveraging allied efforts in your projects and across the federal, the private, and philanthropic spaces is expected to yield that systems change that we've been talking about. It's those changes in culture, in policy, in practice that will be sustained and lasting and allow for the outcomes that we're looking for to be realized. So we invite you to envision, again, how your work connects to this. And with that, I'm now going to turn things over to our distinguished panel which is led by West Ed. You also heard West Ed mentioned as part of the hub. They are here to move us on to next steps, being led by Kathy Booth, who is Project Director of Educational Data and Policy at West Ed and Copi for the Includes Hub. Over to you, Kathy. Thank you so much. So oh, can I can have the clicker, actually, because then I can move forward to the next slide. Thank you. So as you just heard, there's a lot of different ways to think about measurement in the context of a really consequential approach like what we're doing with INCLUDES. And the work that the evaluators do is very, very important because that's the accountability that gets given to the public to show that we're making good use of these dollars. But it's also really important as practitioners to be able to have measures that help you figure out if you are on track. And so what I'm going to be doing is sort of walking through the theory of change and some of the major um, sort of concepts that you're working with within the network to clarify how they fit together and how we measure them. So if I were asked to sort of quickly distill what's in that very complex theory of action, I would say the first thing that we are all trying to do together is find each other. Right? So we are the usual suspects. When there is some opportunity on your campus or your organization to try to make a difference, to make it so that more people can be engaged in STEM, you are probably the people that have always been the first to raise your hands. And so one of the important things that we do with the network is create a space for you to find each other. We are the coalition of the willing, and we're going to be the community that works together to get this work done. So what we end up doing is we create spaces, virtual and in-person, where you all 
can meet and talk and learn from each other. So when we're choosing to measure this, we're figuring out how many people or organizations are being engaged in the work of the network. So that's pretty straightforward. Then we get to collaborative infrastructure. So this is the framework that NSF is encouraging us all to use to make sure that we go beyond what normally happens in reform into something that's much more sustained. So we all know that the way a lot of funding cycles work is that we're encouraged to create these small pilot projects that do an incredible amount of good for a very small number of people. And that, that project then is very vulnerable for when the funding goes away and you might have to start all over again. When we're using collaborative infrastructure, we're getting together with that coalition of the willing, and we are figuring out how we're gonna work together to sustain the change that needs to be made across time, across funding streams, and across particular people. So it's not just you who are doing the work in an ongoing manner. So if we were gonna make an analogy about this, um, I started to think about this as the framing of a house. So I'm from California, and we have earthquakes. And when we build houses in California, we make a really strong foundation. And then when you start putting those support beams up, we bolt them to the foundation so that when things start to shake, the house doesn't fall down. And that's what collaborative infrastructure is helping to do for you all. Because it's establishing the clarity between the actions you're taking and the foundation that you have created as a community. So when things get rough, as you know they always do, you've got some structure to be able to help keep your work going. So if you look at the various concepts that are within um, collaborative infrastructure, I wanna pause for a minute to clarify how they relate back to systems change. So yesterday, a bunch of alliances were here, and they, there was a question that was raised, which is, well, what is the system? And are we changing the same system? And I think that when you look at collaborative infrastructure, we begin to see where these things knit together. So when you have a shared vision, you're basically naming the problem. What is it that we all need to get together? What structure is holding an equity in place? And once we have that, we start building the partnerships. So it's not just each of us individually chipping away at the problem, but we have sustained and clear opportunities to work collaboratively to try to change those problems. And then that leads to goals and metrics. So if we can all agree what the problem is, we have to decide how we're gonna work together to fix that problem, and what are the benchmarks so we know that it's working along the way. Because you don't want to set it all out and say, oh, we totally wanna to make this change that's gonna be 15 years in the future, and get 12 years in and realize that your theory of action was missing something critical. And that's where measurement starts to relate to learning. So then we have leadership and communications. And this is where we are intentionally taking on the problem that too often this work is the product of a couple of dedicated individuals. So I'm sure you've had that experience where there was somebody who worked nights and weekends. There was no way you could ever overburden this person until one day they retired or they got sick and all of a sudden that program evaporated in the institution. And this is why it's so important they're working together to clarify why it is we're doing the work that we're doing so that everybody wants to get on board and to cultivate leadership so there's someone standing in the wings so that when an individual steps back, there's many people ready to step forward. And that's how we relate to sustainability. We really have to be looking at the ways that we are setting this up so that it is not dependent on a single funding stream or a single person, but we're clear about how we all know what needs to get done and we're gonna leverage whatever funding, whatever partnerships we have to make that happen. So how do you measure this? Well, we basically are doing surveys where we ask all of you, about the network members and the alliances in particular, how's it going? Do you feel like you're building stronger partnerships? Are you getting clearer about how you're gonna measure progress? And that's really the only way to get this information because you're the ones on the ground experiencing this. But we can create things like case studies that help clarify what this looks like in action. Which then leads us to systems change. So if you're gonna think, of, again, continuing my house analogy, this is basically the blueprint for a sturdy, inclusive structure. So when I think about how change often happens in um, education or in places that are trying to help people get to STEM occupations, we end up with this problem of just the small project. So you could imagine there's a house that's got a really steep stairwell, maybe a, a building on a campus, a really steep stair. And if you just sort of attach a, a lift to that so that somebody has to sit on a little rickety thing to go up, you're not really making that space open for others. And this is why inclusive design is such a fabulous thing for all of us to be looking at. If you replace that steep stair and the rickety lift with a beautiful curving entry ramp, 
you not only make it more possible for people to get into that building, but you create a space that's welcoming so that lots of people want to go in there. And if you go in the building, and instead of a little warren of little tiny dark rooms where everyone's all on their own trying to solve problems independently, we had big open spaces with plenty of light, we have space to collaborate and realize what we have in common and work more effectively to address those challenges. So there's a lot of ways to define systems change. There's a number of different frameworks that have been used. But we've really been focusing on, on FSG's water of systems change approach. And the reason that I like it is that it takes this sort of high flying ideal of systems change and it makes it super specific. What are the types of actions we all need to be taking if we want to um, short circuit the tendency to go back to pilot programs? So what I want to do is sort of walk you through it um, and give you an example. So I am a community college person, and I have for years been issuing a challenge that I do not understand why there is not a clear pathway from construction crafts certificates to a master's degree in engineering. Because you've got to believe that somebody who has on-the-job experience building something is going to make an incredible engineer. I also know that a lot of the people who work in construction are people of color who are often the first in their family to go to college. And this is an incredible population that we could be tapping into to diversify STEM. But everyone is often struggling because there are many, many, many different structural reasons why it becomes very difficult for those construction craft students to enter an engineering program. So if we go through these different concepts of systems change, the first cluster of things, and basically um, FSG has said there are six conditions, things that we need to be working on in order to generate systems change, and these are interdependent. So we can break them out to talk about them more clearly, but when you're doing the work, you're often doing a lot of these things all at once. So the first thing that you might want to do, if you find a coalition of the willing, a bunch of other people that want to build stronger transfer pathways from community college to four years, from construction crafts to engineering, you're going to look at policies. So this can be big, policy, big P policies like state laws or little P policies like things that we do within institutions. And I know that one of the problems that we have is the articulation agreements between community colleges and four-year institutions. So your group could get together and decide that what you really need to do is address the way you have those articulation agreements so there's more room for credit for prior learning or recognizing the skills taught in courses that are more applied rather than being more conceptual. So you could all work together on making that change. Then under practices, which is the place where I think most of us are in our comfort zone, we could be really thinking about changing up the given for what, when you get to people to ask them for information. So maybe one of the reasons that students are not going on to get a bachelor's degree is they cannot figure out how to enroll full time because they have a job in supporting a family. So what if you embedded into your construction crafts courses an opportunity for a counselor to come in and ask students what is in the way of you enrolling full time and maybe going for a bachelor's degree and then providing counseling to them about where to get the supports that they need to be able to engage more fully. The next one is resource flows, and this, as we already, already heard, is where a lot of us get stuck. We tend to focus on where we're going to get additional funds to make the change, rather than changes to the money that we already have. So maybe what you do, because we know that when community college students transfer to four years, often there's nothing there waiting for them. Or they get sent to orientation with a bunch of 18-year-olds. And that doesn't address the particular challenges and opportunities they're going to have going to a four-year institution. So maybe you agree that you're going to devote some of your funding to be able to have a dedicated orientation for transfer students, and particularly for those folks coming from construction crafts. So those are the explicit structures that are holding inequity in place. Then we get to sort of the semi-explicit, the things that we kind of know uh, but aren't as clearly written down. So the first of those is relationships and connections. So one of the things that I've witnessed is that it's often difficult to get faculty at a four-year institution to trust that their two-year partners have taught with sufficient rigor for what they are going to do going forward. So maybe your collaboration gets together and says, let's have faculty get together with their curriculums and talk to each other. And oh my goodness, when you get faculty together and they're seeing the things that they love and they love to teach in common, you build the trust that makes them more willing to change the articulation agreements so that you can make it easier for those construction students to get bachelor's degrees. 
And then we get to power dynamics. So there's a lot of intersegmental commissions that do things like set the rules for those articulation agreements. But those of us who are community college folks know that we're normally treated like we're second class citizens. Like we get to be at that table, not that we deserve to be there. So if we really address the power dynamics so that we can see the community college practitioners are on the same footing as their four year colleagues, we might be able to get some more things done. And that leads us to the implicit level. Um, this is the implicit bias that we may not even recognize that gets in the way of the work sustaining. So I mentioned earlier that idea, if we had an understanding that someone who had on the ground experience would make a much better engineer, what if we set about making that the default way that people thought about this? That that was the message that was being um, clearly articulated by educators, where we engage employers and make clear why those students are valued, and all of a sudden you go from a scenario where people are saying, why would you expect a bunch of guys that lay drywall to be your future engineers? To saying, let's go to those construction sites, let's go to those classrooms and recruit those people that we know are gonna be so much more effective at the job. So that's sort of how this all fits together. Now you may ask, well, how do you measure that? So this is where the measurement that you do becomes really critical. Because in my experience, I may start something out and I have all these visions. I might have this map for all the changes I want to make. And then I get just mired because the politics get in the way, because your critical ally retired. And all of a sudden, you find yourself defaulting back toward the pilot project model. It is very important that we have very clear benchmarks and ways of knowing as we do the work to make sure that we're carrying through those harder tasks to look at semi-explicit and implicit bias that's uh, affecting our work. So sometimes we're gonna have numbers that are measuring that. So we could say something like, could we look at the percentage of community college practitioners that are fully engaged in that intersegmental commission? But a lot of this information is also gonna be gathered just like we are with collaborative infrastructure through means like um, surveys and focus groups and case studies and narratives that we tell because that's where we're gonna to get to that, that hard truth about what is, being, what is being done that makes it difficult for people to go forward or what it was that unlocked the door so they could. So this is probably gonna be a lot of what we'll need to focus on over the next bit of time and will be the focus of what we are doing in the breakout groups. So there is a fantastic brief that the uh, Coordination Hub put out last year that uh, clarifies the connection between the water systems change model and collaborative infrastructure. Um, also, there was a pre-reading that was sent out that was a webinar that was done by FSG in partnership with some community organizations that really make this real. It's a well-spent hour. I would really, really recommend you're taking a look at it. But of course, I can be here telling you about theory. It's much more important to talk to someone who's done this in action. So I'm really happy to hand over the mic to Dr. Carl Reed from Northeastern, who has really lived this work. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Kathy. Yeah. Wonderful lead up. I wish my family was here to see that introduction um, so that I can get that repeated at home uh, as well. <laughs> Um, thank you, Kathy and Wested and the Coordination Hub for the invi invitation, as well as the NSF Includes. Um, uh, this, is, this is phenomenal work. And I, I, I've been involved with this work since the first design development launch pilot and the, the first convening in 2016 with the 50K Coalition when I was executive director of the National Society of Black Engineers. And we partnered with ASIS, uh, SWE, and SHIP. Uh, to create this, um, this idea of, of transforming undergraduate education by producing 50,000 diverse engineers annually by 2025. So we had that 10-year goal uh, as well, and we got the, the DDLP to really build that, the collaborative infrastructure that ultimately um, became the predecessor or the precursor for the Engineering Plus Alliance uh, as well. Um, Want to recognize the Engineering Plus team? Uh, just kind of wave your hand. Uh, thank you. For, for your support and then obviously um, the, um, your vision uh, as well in the work that you're doing. Um, you know me as a PI for the Engineering Plus Alliance. You know me as uh, maybe the Chief Inclusion Officer at Northeastern University, former Executive Director of NSBE and co-founder of the 50K. But 39 years ago here in this city, I was elected National Chair of the National Society of Black Engineers. Um, I don't look that old, I know. Um, thank. Thank God for good genes. Um, 
but 39 years here in the city. Um, and we were talking about science, broadening, we didn't know the, they had the same language, broadening participation, but science, mathematics, and engineering, SME. If those of you who are around, a, st a T in STEM wasn't really a, a big thing at that time uh, as well, and certainly the second M in medicine uh, at that time. We've made a lot of progress thus far, but we're still asking the same questions. Why is this sort of persistent problem um, that Kathy really started to articulate? As, so what I want to do is just share with you some of the work that we're doing with the Engineering Plus to really operationalize uh, the systems change model uh, as well. And uh, spend the next, you gave me three hours to do this? Okay. <laughs> Um, so the Engineering Plus Alliance was established. We are cohort three. Those of you who are in the room, I mentioned it might have been, I said cohort four. We're cohort three of the, uh, the, uh, of the alliances uh, as well. Uh, and we were established um, two years, so we're just finishing up our second year uh, of this work. As I mentioned, a lot of it builds on the work uh, that we did uh, with the 50K Coalition, and, that, and many of those members are still a part of our alliance as well. We built a multi-sector community of collaborators, so there are 46 collaborators who are part of the, um, the Engineering Alliance uh, right now, and many of them are in this room. Uh, we, uh, some of the leadership includes, of course, Northeastern, um, University of Massachusetts, Boston, University of Connecticut, uh, the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, one of the co-PIs co is American Society for Engineering Education. So you heard about one of the elements of collaborative infrastructure, partnerships, we are very, very clear about partnership. And one of the things that's really cool about our effort is to produce change agents. So uh, the outcome, the leading edge of the, of, of the, the, the leading edge of the Engineering Plus Alliance is to produce hundreds of people working at the institutional and regional level to bring about change. Equipping them with those best practices and scaling those best practices and applying those practices within their institution and taking those learnings and scaling them up regionally. We call those peers, practitioners enhancing engineering regionally. We have 40 peers already we've trained in the first two years. We also have member institutions, 52 member institutions that are part of two regional hubs, one in the Midwest and one on, in uh, the East. And we leverage the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation uh, in, in, in STEM as part of this. One of the things that we've learned in the 50K is building a network is hard work and it's unnecessary because they're already existing in networks out there. And so leveraging existing networks like the Lewis Stokes Alliance enables us to move much more quickly than we had planned. We know a lot of the problems. Uh, it, systems change requires a clear understanding of the current state of, of affairs. And so there are a lot of problems out there, and many of those problems go back hundreds of years with racial inequities, chattel slavery. The U.S. Constitution was built to only benefit the minority of the opulent, as I said, uh, as James Madison writes in the, in the Federalist Papers. So a lot of our systems are built on this, this system of ex exclusion and not inclusion. And so we're trying to dismantle a lot of these systems, and that's why we're seeing the results we're getting, right? Um, every system is perfectly designed to produce the results we're getting. That's what uh, Don Millard introduced us to in that very first con convening, quoting from uh, W. Edward Demings. Every system is perfectly designed to produce the results it gets. So in order to change the results, what do we have to do? We have to change the systems uh, as well. And so, um, so, so we tend to focus on those trends. So those top level uh, above the line. So this is another way to look at the water systems change. It's the above the line, below the line framework. This is the Peter Senge, who is also one of the authors of the water of systems change, uh, really talks about this. And David Peter Stroh's book, Systems Thinking for Social Change, I recommend it highly. It's a great practical, as well as insightful theoretical framework, but he moves into some practical changes that are necessary. I have a copy of the book here in case anybody wants to thumb it. But we tend to focus on the trends, like the trends that I just showed you, which shows that we've only made modest progress in the number of BIPOC, those who identify as BIPOC and women in engineering at the undergraduate and graduate levels as well. But what we don't focus on is what's behind this, what's underlying this, and what, what David Peter Stroh calls the root causes of those complex problems. If you don't take the time as Kathy talked about, to really go into the semi-explicit and the, the implicit levels, 
to understand those mindsets, to understand those relationships, those power dynamics, as well as the explicit levels, the resource flows, et cetera, you're not gonna resolve change. Because that leader, that Tanya Ennis, will leave the UC Bro Boulder and the, and the, and the uh, Gold Shirt program, and that's gonna go back um, to the progress that they, did, they didn't make before that Gold Shirt program was there. So you have to kind of build in those systems, those underlying systems, and give attention to the power dynamics, the mental models that uh, really ultimately lead to the mindsets that, that affect the, the behaviors and the outcomes we're talking about uh, as well. So our hypothesis in the Engineering Plus Alliance is, 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 is simple, right? There's been a lot of good progress. Uh, in ASWE, the Institute for Broadening Participation, NSF, the National, National, the National Academies, they've produced a number of reports on what we need to do. I don't think there's, there's a question of what we need to do to broaden participation in STEM. We know those practices that work, those high touch practices, getting students engaged, high expectations, high self-efficacy, high connections, all those things work, and I can, we can, we, we produce some of that in partnership uh, when I was with uh, uh, Nesby as well. What we lack is a way to consistently leverage the evidence-based high-impact practices. So not the what, but the how. Of course, there's uh, contemporary updates on the what, right? We have to understand, especially in light of the recent decisions and the legislation, there are contemporary updates. But certainly, the how is the critical aspect of this. How do we operationalize this as well? And then, leveraging existing networks to make that happen. And what we like to say is the Engineering Plus Alliance, as much as it is a is an energy for, for creating new change, it really is a platform for the change to occur. It's a platform for evidence-based practices to be scaled and scoped using existing networks uh, as well. So our big picture, systems change has to be uh, kind of accompanied with an ideal future. So we have set a bold, ideal future in every organization I've been a part of. When I was with United Negro College Fund, I was, assist, I was chief academic officer, I was with Nesby, with the 50K, and now engineering. We've always set bold goals. And people say, well, what happens if you fail? So what, right? <laughs> if you set the big goal, you'll fall short. I remember when we set the big goal in Nesby in 2015 to 10,000 black engineers annually by 2025, they said, well, what happened you come up with 7,000? It's like it's still double what we are now. That's a good thing, right? So this kind of deficit approach, no, it's, it's an additive approach. So we've set this big goal to produce 100,000 diverse engineers annually at the undergraduate level and 30,000 working with our partners through systemic, transformative, and sustainable change in engineering education by increasing the growth rate in the number of degrees awarded. Bottom line, that's our elevator speech as well. So how do we do this? We set these bold goals and critical goals that are associated with this. We are partnering with the, the uh, ASWE Diversity Recognition Program. That's a program where 130 institutions have signed on to say we are going to do some work, systems work, to really move the needle with regard to the diversity of our engineering population. We feel that that's a leverage point. It's not the end in and of itself, but it's a leverage point to help institutions move from bronze to silver to gold in that effort. To do that, we are setting up 400 institutional partners. We're setting a goal to have 400 institutional partners in this network to produce 400 change agents, to raise $50 million in endowment because we have to build sustainability into this process and to have 300 industry uh, stakeholders as partners. Now these are higher than what we proposed to NSF, so don't tell NSF uh, <laughs> that we've, we've, we've set these uh, more ambitious goals. So Octavia Butler and my good friend um, Alex Cortez at Bellwether really talks about this. He, I love this quote, right? At the end of the day, the reason we don't see change, folks, is because all struggles are essentially power struggles. And, and who, who will rule, who will lead, who will define, who will refine, who will confine, who will design, who will dominate. So, so whenever we see progress, there's a power struggle, there's a pushback, right? It was the, the, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow. 
It was, it was um, 2008, then the Tea Party. It was et cetera, et cetera. You could see these kind of pushbacks as well that, that exist. It's a power struggle, and we have to understand that. And Kathy was so good at really showing us an example of how power plays in this. So Alex Cortez at Bellwether starts to ask these questions. Which systems does an organization seek to influence? And so Kathy kind of gave us an example of this, and this is what my colleague Michael Silovich asked in the group of alliances yesterday. When we say systems change, you have to have a clear sense of what systems, because you could be attacking the wrong systems as well. What changes does an organization want to achieve for a given system? So again, that's the big vision, the ideal future. The Peter Senge talks about the ideal future. It has to be very clearly. I, I have concern about a lot of efforts that we kind of engage in where we don't have a clear vision. We choose to go to the moon and return by the end of the decade, right? There has to be a clear motivating vision that everybody kind of gets behind as well with a clear understanding of some of the problems and challenges. What does it take to achieve it and, and who needs to be involved? David Peter Sparrow says this very clearly. He says, the whole system has to be in the room. When we talk about relationships, and Kathy kind of explained that, oh, the whole system, who's not in the room? I'm thrilled to have a student panel in this, in this convening. One of the things that we've often not had in our includes convening is to hear the voices of the students uh, as well, those who are directly impacted by the, all the work that we're doing. Uh, so the whole system has to be in the room. And so you've heard this. I don't have to go into this uh, as well. But one of the things I want to say is, the, the, the model talks about the six conditions of systems change, but how do we do it? And so I'm gonna just kind of share with you another kind of a complementary model that Alex uh, Cortez and the Bellwether system has, has really focused on. So Kathy talked about small projects. A lot of us start with small projects, summer bridge programs or, or uh, intensive advising programs or, or, or tutoring programs or whatever, scholarships, et cetera. Small projects that's, that's there. Those are what he calls direct impact. They affect the fish that's swimming in the lake, right? Um, uh, uh, Leon Andrews of, of edu uh, Equal Vent Measures talks about this, this another kind of a thing in, in, interesting. We affect the fish swimming in the lake, but don't affect the lake, right? Making sure that the lake quality is okay for the fish as well. And so what, what he says is great projects, what I think includes this does is moves things from a direct impact to what he called a wider impact. It's taking the ideas that work in one institution and applying it to another institution uh, as well, or another network uh, as well, and that's wider impact. But it, at the end of the day, that's good, and I love the fact that we're starting to talk about, well, how do we have systemic impact uh, as well? And, and in fact, the theory of change model that uh, Tori Smith kind of uh, pr pr uh, showed earlier really gets at this, but it's a progress, it's progress made. And so going from direct impact, and I'll move through this quickly, it says, it says taking the, what's working at one location or one program, et cetera, and serving as a test kitchen, okay? Making sure, does it work in another other institution? And if it does, then making sure we're doing the research to understand what's working and what are the elements of one uh, initiative that applies to another institution that works. That's getting to wider impact. Uh, and that's what we tried to do with the 50K, that's what we're doing with the Engineering Plus, and that's what a lot of includes alliances are as well. But at some point, we need to provide evidence and insights to shift systemic conditions. What are those systemic conditions that continue to get in the way, even around wider impact? And those are the things that really begin to define those systems. Yesterday we talked about, I think Aaron talked about our why, right? If, if we can articulate our why, it begins to identify evidence and elements of the system that we're trying to break as well. And then we build the coalition. That's what we're doing, right? With includes, that's what we're doing with the convening that we uh, that had earlier in the week where the, the, the includes alliances and, and the other partners are coming together thinking about what does the coalition look like uh, in order to really address that. And ultimately, those coalitions create systemic conditions that enable broader adoption of programs. So at the Alliance, our Alliance, we use data as key to inform a lot of that. So Rebecca Zark is here with Sage Fox. She's leading our data team, our research team, and evaluation team as well. We're not just looking at Alliance progress. So I think what Kathy talked about earlier, which is how are we doing? 
right? What's Westhead is measuring and others. How are we doing around this? That's alliance progress. But at the end of the day, what matters is the equity. It's the external. How we really affect and change. And we're trying to get around that. We're trying to identify that now. So we're looking at sort of framing the context um, in, in order to identify the priority problems. Uh, we, we've identified a lot of those problems. We've identified we've, to inform the strategies as well at the Engineering Plus Alliance. We've done the landscape analysis. We've developed a data, um, a landscape tool that all of our member institutions can access in Tableau to see their data relative to others on progress on enrollment, admissions, uh, graduation rates, et cetera. That's built into our, our systems as well. That has to inform that work uh, as well. And then we're, we're rolling out sort of not only tools, but leveraging existing tools uh, that, that exist there. But we're still kind of getting to this, how do we measure the systems change that we're trying to ach achieve? So at the end of the day, and this is my last slide, we just have to be kind of very clear about what is the problem that we're trying to solve. That has to be very clear. When I was in software and software development, we used to call it go slow to go fast. Defining the requirements upfront is key to the work that has to be done. And so sh shaping the problem has got to be the first work of the alliance uh, as well, and understanding the systems that, that exist and where, why we're, where we are as well. And then kind of articulating a future state, a shared vision of a future state. It has to be something that motivates people and gets people inspired uh, as well. Meeting just a meeting is insufficient. We do that at universities all the time, right? It's just insufficient and it doesn't motivate people. It doesn't keep them excited. There's no joy in meeting just a meeting uh, as well. And I'm an introvert, so I'm, 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 I'm sharing, sharing that as well. And then what are the system attributes that need to change? So um, a perfect example was given today around construction uh, students who received associates in construction to engineering. What are those, those, those attributes that need to change? And at the end of the day, how to take those attributes and apply it uh, from direct impact to shared to, uh, to widespread impact and ultimately to systemic impact. And of course, using data as part of it. So thank you so very much for your time. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reed, for sharing that awesome example of how these frameworks and terms are starting to show up in your work. Um, I'm Alice Opalka. I'm with ORS Impact. So we're the Coordination Hub's internal um, evaluator. And I'll just close us out um, by sharing some examples of how these ideas are showing up in the network um, today. So while you all might not always use these terms or frameworks in your day-to-day -day work, we're hoping that at this point you might be starting to recognize or think about how some of these aspects of the frameworks are present in the work that you're doing. Um, and so like I said, our goal is just to close out by sharing a few examples of how systems change is showing up in network members' work and also how some network members are seeing that connection between collaborative infrastructure and systems change. So the first example I want to share is drawn from the annual national network survey. And so while that survey is primarily about kind of helping us learn how the network is developing, what members are interested in, what kind of outcomes are coming about, the last two years we also asked a very open-ended question, which is how does systems change toward broadening participation show up in your project. And we wanted to ask that just to see how folks are thinking about this right now and also kind of what areas their work in their perception is starting to touch on. And so we decided to categorize the responses in alignment with that waters of systems change framework. Um, and I'll just make the note that of course this is just a survey response. Um, the responses were not super long so we used our best judgment to kind of try to categorize them across the groupings, but there were some that didn't quite fit, and so we also had another category. Um, but even so, there's some really interesting patterns that started to show up. And one of those was just that in this year, in 2023, from our most recent survey, there's quite a bit more spread across those six um, sort of subcategories of systems change. So you can see in 2022, the biggest category by far was that practices category, which makes a lot of sense. So folks sharing examples of how they were, for example, changing like programmatic um, aspects of their university programs to support underrepresented students or 
you know, offering more PD to faculty members, so really great examples. And that was still a really common response. But this year we saw a lot more people sharing examples of how um, their work was shifting resource flows, not as much funding, but a lot around like information sharing, best practice sharing, funding opportunities. We also saw a lot more people talking about relationships and connections, so talking about cross-organization collaboration, cross-sector relationships, creating more relationships with leadership to support more buy-in on their work. And I thought even though this was the, um, the least common response, I did want to surface as well that there was, a, there was an increase in folks talking about shifting power dynamics in their work. So few people in 2022 shared examples of that. But this year, a handful of people shared examples of how they were deferring more decision-making opportunities to student groups, for example, or creating new advisory boards or creating new committee membership opportunities to have more representation in decisions. Um, and the other thing I want to share is as Kathy mentioned, none of these systems change buckets lives in isolation. And one pattern we saw is that a lot of the examples folks shared had overlap, especially between that relationships and connections category um, and some of the other categories as well. So for example, people talking about how they're using collective impact models to push forward policy changes or how they're developing new relationships to share resources and best practices. Um, and so we thought this was a great example of kind of how, especially that relationships piece seems to be so crucial to the work we're doing. And is of course a big aspect of the work we're doing today in, in the network. So the second example I wanted to share was how some Alliance members are using, or starting to envision using the elements of collaborative infrastructure to support more coherent systems change efforts across the STEM ecosystem. And so for folks who were here yesterday at the Alliance's meeting, this is probably familiar. Um, but last year, some Alliance members met, had a convening, and following the convening, shared a report which offered a new vision for how they really saw an opportunity to deepen systems change efforts and impact through alignment across all of the different individual projects and efforts they were engaging in. And how by extending support for more collaboration, they really saw the opportunity to accelerate systems change efforts towards broadening participation. And they use this metaphor of this braided river, which is where that image is from, of how you can take all of these individual diverse efforts to kind of advance changes across the full STEM ecosystem, touching on so many different points. And so as part of that report, these Alliance members encouraged the National Science Foundation and the Coordination Hub to take several different actions, and I'm not gonna list all of them, but these actions kind of helped to illustrate that opportunity for collaborative infrastructure. So a few of them were, they talked about improving the mechanisms for collaboration to promote deeper sharing and reflection across the alliances, which of course is an example of really digging into that collaborative infrastructure element of partnerships and communication. They also talked about defining better mechanisms um, for data sharing, which is an example of that collaborative infrastructure element of shared goals and metrics. And then the lastly, they talked about having more training for scale and growth to kind of accelerate and sustain their efforts, which again is an example of really leaning into that collaborative infrastructure element of expansion, sustainability, and scale. Um, and so again, just wanted to share these two examples, but especially this one as an example of how that collaborative infrastructure framework can be used to really push forward and be a foundation, as Kathy shared earlier, to support real systemic change efforts. Um, and so just to close out, we were really excited and encouraged to see just how even in the first few years of this network's development, um, these real like ideas and progress towards systems change are starting to bubble up from all the different projects across, across the network. And so the breakout following this um, session is going to be an opportunity for you all to really dig into those elements of systems change and think about how that can apply to your work. So I'm going to pass back to Kathy to explain how that will look. I think actually Aaron's going to be coming back up, but I can go, or I can do it if you'd like. Um, there is a slide back at the beginning, so we're just going to go back in time real fast, that shows all the different breakout rooms. Look at all the things we learned. Okay, where'd it go? Well, now I'm going to go away. Try again. I didn't. I thought oh, maybe that we had a switch up. I thought I saw it. Okay. 
Never mind, my apologies. All right, so what we want to do is give you a chance to have a, an application of one of those six conditions of systems change where you really dig into it and you're like, okay, so if I'm trying to change power dynamics, what might that look like and how would I measure it? Oh, there it is. Thank you so much. So some of you picked your topic before. If you have forgotten, if you go into the Cvent app, it will remind you which of these six practices you picked. But if you didn't, don't worry. You can just pick the one that's of most interest to you. If you take a picture with your phone, you can see the room in which each of these sessions are going to be held. We are going to have about a 20-minute break before we go in because we have to reset some of the rooms. Some of this space we're in now are going to be turned into breakout rooms. So you've got a little bit of time for a break. And then when you get there, what you're going to be doing is hearing from a practitioner about what they're doing, talking to a peer about what you have done, and thinking about what it is you'd like to do and what supports you need. That session's going to run shorter than originally planned, so we'll get ourselves back on the calendar, but you still have about 20 minutes until we go in. 15, 15 minutes until we go in, and that would mean that we're at 10.50 right now, so at 11.05, please make your way to one of these rooms, and we'll get rolling. Thank you so much. <laughs>